Uh, I'm Vanya Skoric, uh, a program director uh, at ECNL and uh, working on this topic uh, again for a, for a number of years and happy to share it with you. Uh, just a small caveat at the beginning, uh, we do this training usually for three days in a workshop. Uh, we have condensed it into five online days per two hours, so 10 hours total for online purposes. And then we have condensed this condensed version further <laughs> for, a, for an afternoon or, or an hour and a half. So please bear with us uh, as we try to explain some of the things that, you know, for us are kind of our, our daily bread. And we do understand that there will be a lot of questions, a lot of unknowns, probably loose ends as well from our side. We do have a lot of material. Uh, I was discussing with your colleagues, you know, whether we should send you some reading up front or it's better to wait to hear some of your questions and maybe in the end, uh, some of the information and feedback on what additional subtopics of this would be useful for you to learn more about so that we can actually send you some useful follow-up material to look into. Yeah. So it, having said that, we, we also see this as a beginning of the conversation about this topic. Yeah. So this training is not a one-off opportunity and then we will never talk again. Uh, we are happy to talk again. We are happy to follow up on particular issues, particular topics, particular questions. Uh, so please have that in mind. The second uh, thing I want to share with you is uh, please uh, don't hesitate to stop and ask questions. Let's have this as a dialogue. Uh, I don't mind uh, and my colleagues don't mind if you stop us uh, and ask a question. If there is a question in the chat, I will just ask somebody to, to, to keep an eye on it and read it for us because I won't be able to, to, to read the chat all the time. Okay. So if there is something unclear or you have like immediate question, we'll have a question and answer section in the end. But if there is something immediately that needs clarifying, please do stop me at any time. So, so with that in mind, uh, we can start. Uh, we can start with some terminology and jargon. And again, uh, apologies in advance for using jargon. Uh, it will slip uh, for sure uh, as we speak because we are so used to it. But just to unpack at least a couple of words. When we talk about NPOs, non-profit organizations, essentially this is the terminology used in this field for civil society at large. So any organization or arrangement that is not for profit. When we talk about FATF, it's the Financial Action Task Force, and we will explain what that global body is. When we talk about TF, it's terrorism financing. CFT is countering the financing of terrorism. IML is anti-money laundering. R8, sometimes we use that uh, shortened version for the recommendation eight. It's a standard for nonprofit organizations. Uh, and we will explain what that is. And IO10, uh, we sometimes refer to uh, as immediate outcome 10, also one of the standards for nonprofit organizations, and we'll explain it what that means. Now, you probably are aware already about different longer term and worldwide effects of uh, different restrictions stemming from the securitization space. I just want to mention a couple of things here. So to give you like a global overview that we see on this topic, there is an increase of adopting securitization related measures that do really restrict civil society and civic space. And this is done within the frameworks of countering terrorism, of countering violent extremism, of countering financing of terrorism, of anti-money laundering and other securitization policies. Now, for each of these, uh, there is a need to really unpack it and understand it. And today's focus for our discussion is actually unpacking and understanding the countering financing of terrorism part. You're probably more familiar with the structure, with, with counterterrorism structures, maybe at the UN uh, uh, level and UN streams and bodies uh, and architecture that has been built throughout the years on the counterterrorism. Countering financing terrorism and anti-money laundering is a little bit of a niche structure. And there is a particular body we'll discuss today covering these standards, right? So just to understand, we are not talking about 
overall packages and frameworks within the securitization space. Today, we're focusing on countering financing terrorism, and we are touching upon anti-money laundering as well, because these are connected. And there, there are already reports from the Human Rights Council, from the uh, uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Countering Terrorism, about the impact of these measures on civil society. I just uh, put a couple of uh, these here for reference. I'm sure you know a lot already examples of the overregulation in this field. Uh, I'll just skip through this quickly, uh, just as a reminder uh, for, for, for us to keep in mind the, the breadth of the different restrictions and measures coming from very administrative parts of licensing, government requirement, uh, through barriers on some operational uh, legitimate uh, activities, uh, vague grounds for dissolution or suspension of organizations, wide discretions to deny registration uh, based on very broad or vague grounds, uh, extra legal harassments by security authorities. I'm sure you're very familiar with that part as well. Uh, branding of civil society or human rights as uh, terrorists, broad discretions to seize the assets or to, to, to freeze the funds uh, under the terrorism or money laundering label, uh, inability to access funding, especially this uh, clamps down on the foreign funding, different uh, bans uh, or requirements to get approvals for funding and so on. The list goes on and on. Uh, all of these, we like to place them in a, in a kind of a real context and, and real consequence environment. So these restrictions do really have real consequences on the ground coming from no delivery of services, uh, canceled programs or projects, uh, resources of organizations or time of organizations spent on various, uh, sometimes even ludicrous, burdensome requirements rather than actual activities and, and missions, not to mention the damage of the reputation uh, and the smear campaigns uh, against civil society. And of course, the uh, ability to actually raise funding, or especially the cross-border or, or uh, foreign funding, uh, has been restricted or limited. So the question that was asked recently was actually, are these real legal restrictions on civil society effective? Do they actually uh, uh, contribute to the goal, proclaimed goal, of uh, fighting uh, money laundering and terrorism financing. And actually the, the uh, research that I linked here, and we'll share all the links in one email afterwards for easier reference so you don't have to scramble uh, through the presentation now. Uh, so the research that was actually done uh, two years ago uh, clearly demonstrated that there is no uh, connection uh, between uh, enhancing legal restrictions into reducing the actual number of terrorist attacks or terrorist threats within the country. So they really did a very you know, empirical uh, and statistical research uh, on this uh, uh, issue. On the contrary, there is evidence that legal restrictions create even more terrorism financing and money laundering risks uh, because they actually uh, restrict civil society from doing the critical work. Right, So they're actually uh, constraining the resources, crippling the uh, uh, capacities of organizations to actually do the work in the communities which might be prone uh, or, or, con or to alleviate the, the, the conditions that are conducive for a uh, terrorism threat. So on the contrary, so this is, this is something that we are trying to convey also to the, to the uh, standard setting bodies, that on the contrary, you know, the work that you're actually kind of producing by producing these standards that cause overregulation is actually completely uh, undermining the work you're trying to achieve and goals you're trying to achieve. Vanya, before you move, yeah. can, I ask, um, can I ask a question that's been um, sort of in my mind, actually? Yeah. Is there any research or evidence that civil society organizations are particularly prone to enabling terrorism financing or money laundering for terrorism because uh, you know what is the basis for we'll these come to that. yeah okay we'll, we'll come to that in a few slides okay thank you so 
coming, I, I mentioned bodies and standards. Uh, this is an already outdated map, uh, but it does serve the purpose of how this structure in the sphere and in the field of countering financing terrorism looks like. So in the center of this structure, you will see the FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, will explain what it is. Then above that, you'll see different bodies connected and attached directly to the FATF. Now, these are the regional bodies of the FATF. So the FATF and its regional bodies essentially cover all the territories in the world. All countries and territories, even those that are not recognized as countries, are covered within these bodies for the purposes of implementing the standards that they set. Now, the FATF itself has around 40 member states so far. You can imagine mostly, uh, you know, uh, developed Western uh, countries, the usual uh, 40 that you could name probably from the top of your head. Uh, they have also uh, different bodies as observers. The European Union, World Bank, IMF, OECD, OEC, African Development Bank, Asian Development Bank, Eurojust, Interpol, Europol, and so on. So many, many, many uh, bodies connected with policing, security, finance, all of them are observer members of the FATF. Also, observer members are from the UN side. So everybody from the UN architecture working on the topics of financial crimes, terrorist financing, money laundering, or counterterrorism uh, at large are also connected and observer members of the FATF. Now, the member states, uh, delegations to the FATF include usually the ministries of finance, treasuries, ministries of justice, security, foreign affairs, central banks, uh, or financial integrity or financial intelligence units. So a little bit more on a technical side. If you can imagine, if we, if we can simplify uh, gravely the division, if you imagine the UN being mostly the ministries of foreign affairs uh, working on the issues, the FATF is uh, mostly the finance people and the finance and you know hardcore security people uh, from the governmental structures, right? So this is the kind of a division, uh, let's say, of, of, of their uh, competences. And that re reflects in the mandate, actually, of the Financial Action Task Force. So this is not an international organization. It's a task force. As such, it's very opaque, very difficult to penetrate its processes, to understand it. They don't have any transparency policy or accountability to anyone besides their members. They are standard setting and they are assessing compliance on their standards in the sphere of money laundering and terrorism financing. Terrorism financing was added as their competence immediately after 9-11, right? So before that, they were originally uh, formed for the purpose of money laundering uh, fight. Their seat is in Paris. As, an, as I mentioned, their regional bodies attached to the main body are really covering the entire world. Now, the main body, FATF, the 40 member states, actually set the standards. All the others need to adopt the same standards and methodologies and need to implement them. So the main role of this body is to set the rules, standards and procedures and the methodology for assessing how the member states and all the others in, in regional bodies uh, implement these standards and rules. If you, again, try to compare it with the UN architecture, uh, the UN city counterterrorism architecture has more of a role of uh, adopting resolutions, conventions, sanctions, these types of uh, 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 policy or, or regulatory mechanisms. Here, the FATF is a more technical body. That's why it's more complex to understand. That's why it's more, I would say, sneaky, because all of it is uh, covered under the veil of the technical compliance, uh, really technical uh, methodology, and all of it is still highly political, okay? So for UN, we know it's highly political. Here, they kind of hide under the technical part, but it's still highly political, right? 
now the proclaimed goal uh, for the FATF standards in the whole, uh, their main assumption is if the countries implement all the standards correctly, they and their economies and their societies will be protected from the threats of money laundering and terrorism financing. And particularly for the sector of the non-profit organizations, the proclaimed goal is to protect the non-profit sector from the abuse from terrorism financing, right? They see it as a critical component in the global fight against terrorism. So they basically set the standards that protect the uh, economic uh, structure and then different sectors in the country from the terrorist and money laundering abuse. And nonprofit sector is just one small piece of that puzzle. They have 40 different standards, 40 different recommendations, four zero different recommendations for a variety of uh, 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 stakeholders, sectors, and the economy as a whole. Only one of them refers to the nonprofit sector and it causes most problems for everyone. You'll, you'll see why. Now, the question of Milena, what are actually abuses for terrorist financing purpose in the nonprofit sector? FATF conducted in 2014, in 2014, uh, a research, global research, uh, and they produced a typologies report in 2014 on what are the types of the cases for the abuse of nonprofit sector in the field of terrorism financing. They identified around 107 cases globally out of the entire nonprofit world they identified the member states and member countries from across the globe sent 107 cases total of the potential abuses. And these cases were divided under several different categories. One was the diversion of funds. So the organization receives funds for one thing and then diverts it for something else for terrorism financing purposes. Affiliation with the terrorist entity knowingly or being abused unknowingly by the organization, support to recruitment efforts, different means, in-kind support uh, or financial support, abuse of programming, this is a little bit vague, uh, essentially claiming that somebody internally in the organization could abuse the programs of proclaimed activities and goals of organization for the purpose of probably promoting uh, a terrorism um, agenda and false representation. This is effectively the sham NGOs, the, the, the organizations that pretend to be non-profit but are actually developed for, for the purpose, solely for the purpose of, uh, you know, uh, transferring funds somewhere else. Uh, so essentially they do admit, so the, even the FATF admits that this is a very, very small number, very small percentage of organizations or individuals that have taken advantage of the nonprofit sector. So why this entire standard for the nonprofit sector? The standard for nonprofit sector, the recommendation eight that we will talk about today was introduced three months after 9-11. Why? because there were intelligence reports uh, uh, that sh showed or indicated that Saudi uh, non-profit charity money was used to uh, finance 9-11 attacks. And from there, uh, the US put pressure to introduce some kind of standard uh, anti-terrorism anti -terrorism financing standard for the charities sector, for the non-profit sector. And they uh, used the wording, so they, they introduced this one standard with one sentence wording that claimed in 2001, so before any kind of typology or background report, uh, that nonprofit organizations are particularly vulnerable to terrorist financing abuse and therefore they need to be monitored, uh, overseen, uh, and so on, a, a lot of different things. Now, in 2014, when this typology report came out and there was evidence that, of course, it's a ludicrously small percentage of organizations that could even be found to be suspect of being abused by terrorism for terrorism financing purposes, 
And when our global coalition started producing more and more evidence and started being vocal and advocating to remove this labeling from the FATF that nonprofit organizations are particularly vulnerable to terrorism financing because there's no evidence and it's being used and abused to restrict civil society organizations. Then finally, two years later, in 2016, the FATF changed the recommendation eight to include a more nuanced language and a more more uh, appropriate language on uh, the various safeguard requirements that would ideally, if applied correctly, really protect nonprofit organizations from the abuse, but also protect their legitimate activities and be in line with international human rights law and human rights standards. And we'll see how that went. So just before we go into the standard itself, I want to explain that the FATF has a particular definition for the nonprofit sector. So in order to qualify for a nonprofit organization and to be uh, uh, considered under the FATF standards, the organization itself must fulfill three criteria. It has to be a legal person or arrangement or organization. So all the non-registered or non-legal uh, entities don't qualify. It has to primarily engage in raising or dispersing funds. So there has to be some money flow uh, coming and going uh, in and out of the organization. And the purpose should be, broadly speaking, public benefit, charitable, religious, cultural, social, any other type of good work. So this is a very broad uh, category, right? So when you imagine all the civil society and all the nonprofits in one country, not all of them actually fit the definition of the FATF. This is important to remember when we come to the part of uh, introducing, when countries introduce measures to uh, implement these standards. And we'll see how this definition of nonprofit sector actually narrows down as we go through the standard itself. So the core documents, I keep mentioning the standards, 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 the, the actual two core documents that we need to look at are uh, first the technical standard. So the technical compliance of 40 standards known as recommendations. So this is the kind of compilation of all the FATF standards and you can find it online on their website as FATF recommendations. So they are being updated every year almost when they change uh, some of the recommendations. Each recommendation is very short, as you will see, but then it's accompanied by a longer interpretative note document. And these interpretative note documents have the same standard level or power, regulatory power, as the standard itself, right? So it has to be read uh, jointly. Then the second core document is the methodology document. Actually, how the countries should implement these standards and then how the FATF and other their regional bodies should assess uh, or evaluate the effectiveness of the implementation. And these include 11 standards that are known as immediate outcomes. So these are basically, if you think, you know, in, the, in, in our sector terminology, these are the objectives you want to achieve or the, go the goals you want to achieve with these standards. Yeah. So are you achieving the goals of the standards and how effective are you in actually achieving these goals? So this is the two things that each country needs to satisfy. Yeah. They need to satisfy the technical compliance, which is mostly the legal framework, the regulatory framework. And then they have to satisfy also the effectiveness uh, requirement, which is how well is your system, your country actually adapted to implement all of these standards. So who evaluates that? <coughs> Let's unpack a little bit this procedure. The FATF on its website has a link with assessment calendars. And in these assessment calendars, you can see for every country where they are in the process. Uh, so who decides uh, when the evaluations and assessments will happen and when? Essentially, the FATF decides as a body that they are going to enter a new cycle of evaluations. And once they decide to start a new cycle of evaluations, usually it's done every 10 years. So one cycle 
lasts for 10 years. And in that cycle, they evaluate effectively every country in the world, FATF and its regional bodies. They produce a calendar jointly with uh, countries, in agreement with countries, and then they say, okay, you are going to be evaluated in March 2021, for example. Okay, what does that actually mean? That means that there is an evaluation team that is going to be formed, and this evaluation team will conduct the whole assessment. The whole assessment lasts for one to one and a half year, usually around one year and three months. Why? Because the assessment team needs to evaluate, as I mentioned, two things. One is the entire technical compliance on 40 recommendations throughout the entire legal and regulatory framework in the country. And two, they need to actually go into the country, have a visit, on-site visit, where they stay for two weeks, they speak to all the relevant stakeholders, governmental and non-governmental, and they try to essentially evaluate how well does the country effectively implement these standards. Then they go back and the evaluation team drafts the first report, the first analysis. This report is going back and forth between the evaluation team, the FETF, the country, evaluation team, FETF country, so on. Negotiations are there ongoing. This is all completely confidential. Nobody has access, nobody knows who the team is, nobody knows what the report looks like until they agree on the uh, content. And then the FATF officially adopts a final evaluation report at their plenary session. And then this mutual evaluation report is publicly available. It's published. The process doesn't stop there. The report has scores for each recommendation for each of the standards and report also contains follow-up requirements and follow-up recommendations, what the country should do to actually improve their effective implementation, how the country should progress further on. This follow-up can be regular follow-up and then it lasts a couple of years and then every five years they, they have a kind of a mini evaluation and so on. I won't go into technical details because it gets too complicated. It also has an enhanced follow-up. So countries that are deemed problematic, uh, they that have lower scorings on many recommendations, and there is a particular grid and scale which countries fall under problematic countries. These countries are put into the enhanced follow-up, and they have to basically write a progress report every year. So every year, then the plenary session of the FATF or its regional body assesses progress of the country in the enhanced follow-up. You can imagine a lot of our usual problematic countries that have problems with human rights records, civic space records, and so on, are in fact also in the enhanced follow-up for different reasons. No, no connection to actual human rights abuses, but simply you know, the functioning of all the different mechanisms, accountability mechanisms and finance system mechanisms within the country. Usually they are also in the enhanced follow-up. Usually that means that they want to, uh, they strive hard to make a progress with these standards from the FATF. And usually that also means they churn out legislation and regulation that restricts civil society in the name of this particular topic because they want to try and do good uh, for the purpose of scoring better uh, for the FATF. Now, why, and then it's all on a repeat. So this evaluation process is ongoing, it's constant. The country is constantly in some kind of follow-up, regular, enhanced. They're constantly being evaluated every couple of years. There's a constant cycle of you know, going through this. So the country is never off the hook. Now, two important questions. Who's on the evaluation team? And why do countries actually care to get the good score? Who's on the evaluation team? The peer government representatives from the FATF. So if we look at the FATF, 40 countries, the evaluation team will have up to 12 people, 12 to 15 people uh, that come from the peer countries, member states of the FATF, 
usually from the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Justice, Central Bank, FYU, Financial Intelligence or Integrity, Integrity Unit, maybe someone from security or uh, intelligence uh, institution and so on. No one of these people you can imagine has probably ever worked with or had gone in touch with the nonprofit sector and civil society, let alone international standards on human rights. Yeah, so they have absolutely no clue about this at all. Why do countries care to score well? The countries care to score well because the FATF, unlike the UN and other human rights bodies, has actual teeth. They have actual consequences, which are actually tangible financial consequences for the countries. So if the country scores fairly low, and again, different scoring boards, I'll explain uh, how that works. If the country is low in the scoring board overall, uh, they might be put on a gray list. The gray list of the countries is publicly available on the FATF website. It essentially means the country has significant deficiencies in their economic and financial system, which is a signal for any kind of investor, development bank, anyone who wants to do any business with this country or with the business sector in this country, not to do it, yeah, because they have significant deficiencies in actually uh, 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 securing their financial flows or criminal activities in the countries. Even if the country is not on the gray list, but scores low, in, and particularly if it's in an enhanced follow-up, which many countries are, it's still a bad signal for investors, right? So they get lower credit rating, they might not get, uh, you know, they get uh, a loan that is more unfavorable uh, with higher interests um, or they don't get investment uh, from uh, an investing investment bank or, or IMF uh, and so on. So these are really concrete consequences. And that's why countries will do everything to score well on this, right? So... This is how the mutual evaluation process looks like as a, you know, as a visual representation. And you can also see this photo on the, on the FATF website themselves. So they try to visualize how long it takes, what is the each phase, and what essentially what happens in each phase, as I described. So first, there is a technical review, meaning the technical compliance of all the uh, legal and uh, regulatory framework. Then the actual visit, where people come in and speak to different government representatives and different sector representatives. And then back and forth with the report drafting, a lot of political negotiations there for sure. We don't know, we only hear rumors. And then in the end, a public report that contains useful information for our nonprofit sector side. Two important things here. During the on-site visit, so when the evaluators team visits the country, they talk to the nonprofit sector. In the recent couple of years, they actually made it uh, almost like an obligation for uh, evaluators to talk to the nonprofit sector as well. There's good news and there's bad news here. Bad news is the government makes a list of nonprofits that would be appropriate to talk to the evaluators. These nonprofits need to actually fit into the FATF definition for nonprofit organizations, right? The good news is the evaluation team can always request to talk to anybody else. So the evaluation team, if they get information up front about particular concerns, can always request to talk to additional organizations that they deem important for the issue. We'll come to that, how that can be made possible. Uh, another important point here, uh, when the report is published, uh, the end result is this type of the scoring board. So on the left-hand side, you can see the scoreboard for FATF standards, for the recommendations. The countries can be compliant, largely compliant, partially compliant or non-compliant with the FATF recommendations. 
And in our case, in, with that one particular recommendation we are looking at. On the right hand side, you see the scoreboard for the immediate outcomes. So basically the goals that the FATF is trying to achieve. So these could be high, achieving high effectiveness, substantial effectiveness in implementation, moderate effectiveness and low effectiveness. Now, this report after the approval and publication, as I mentioned, has follow up uh, hints. So countries are actually required to address the shortcomings that are identified in the report. So, for example, if you look at the latest report from Turkey from 2019 from the FATF, and if you look up the section for the non-profit sector, you will see what the FATF actually recommended to the country to do about non-profit sector. And then, of course, you can match it up with what the government actually did. In the case of our law, the reason why we're all here, you could see that doesn't match. The government didn't do what the FATF actually said they should do and what was found as a deficiency for the, this particular standard. We can come to that more closely uh, when, we, when we talk in the groups as well. So this is again, uh, this report is again a tool uh, similar to various, you know, UN reports uh, that we like to use for our advocacy tools in, in our advocacy, you know, toolbox. Th this report should be considered as a tool uh, for the country level advocacy or global advocacy as well. If you know the standard and if you can understand and unpack what it says, right? So when you look at the section on the non-profit sector in a particular FATF related report from the evaluation from a particular country, you can figure out what they actually ask the country to do. And then you can figure out whether the country actually is doing that. Uh, and there are various reasons why countries misinterpret, misunderstand, or simply ignore what the FATF says in the report. There are various consequences for that, and we'll come to that in our advocacy part uh, discussion. So let's see what the standard for nonprofit sector actually asks for, right? So we have been talking about how the process goes and what are the over uh, overall uh, 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 standards and methodologies and how they fit together. But let's see what is actually asked from the country to do about the nonprofit sector. There are three parts uh, of that topic. One is the overarching approach. So the FATF uh, adopted an overarching risk-based approach, which sounds reasonable. It says in the recommendation one, so this is the first recommendation and it covers all the rest of the standards. It says countries should identify, assess and understand the money laundering and terrorism financing risks for the entire country. And then countries should take action to ensure these risks are mitigated effectively. So the FATF asks from the countries to first identify, assess and understand their own risks of money laundering, terrorism financing, and then to actually uh, propose and develop certain measures to mitigate those risks and to mitigate them in an effective way. So this is a risk based approach in a nutshell. And this applies to every standard, to all recommendations. So all countries need to uh, implement this in a way required by the FATF. The second part of uh, the standard is the actual recommendation eight and its interpretive note. For the sake of brevity, we'll just unpack the recommendation eight here and then I'll briefly mention what is additionally importantly mentioned in the interpretive note. But just to say that, you know, in the usual training, we usually spend one day unpacking the whole thing. So <laughs> I know you will have questions and unclarity after this, but you know, we can always discuss it later on or some other day when we look and compare it directly with the laws and measures in Turkey, right? So what does recommendation eight actually says? This is the whole text. This is what you see on the slide. That's recommendation eight. There's nothing more. Okay. The interpretive note comes separately. It says that countries should review the adequacy of laws and regulations that relate to non-profit organizations, but not all, 
those which the country has identified as being vulnerable to terrorist financing abuse. And then countries should apply focused and proportionate measures in line with the risk-based approach, which is the overarching approach, to such non-profit organizations, meaning those that were identified as being vulnerable, to protect them from terrorist financing abuse. And then it lists three potential examples of abuse. We already mentioned these examples when we talked about types of abuse, so I won't go into them again. So essentially the red parts of this definition, of this recommendation, tell the countries what they need to do. Now, if you understand this now, you are a genius because nobody understands what that actually means in practice and how this should be done in practice. There are numerous, again, interpretative notes, best practice documents and so on, guidance, but it is really, really difficult to really unpack what this should be in practice. We tried and we'll try to convey to you what we know and how we understand it. Suffice to say, from 202 territories covered by the FATF recommendations, seven of them managed to fully comply so far with this particular recommendation, meaning that they got the compliant uh, score on this recommendation. Seven out of 202 covered by the FATF. So the countries misinterpret, misapply, and misuse on purpose this particular recommendation. It's complex, but let's try to unpack it further on. Let's see the third part of the, of the equation, which is the effectiveness. Remember when I mentioned the immediate outcomes, the goals uh, that the FATF is looking for. So the goal for the non-profit sector part is that terrorists and terrorist organizations are actually prevented from raising, moving and using funds and from abusing the MPO sector, right? So the whole purpose of this show is to prevent any bad actor to actually misuse the organization for uh, uh, raising funds or abusing funds. So the question in the immediate outcome 10.2 that refers to the nonprofit organizations, the question that the FATF is asking the country is, to what extent, without actually disrupting legitimate MPO activities, has the country implemented a targeted approach? Has the country conducted outreach towards the nonprofit sector and then exercised oversight in dealing with non-profit organizations that are at risk from the terrorist abuse. So not all non-profit organizations, non-profits that are at risk. So remember again, the step one, uh, when we talked about the overall approach, identifying the risk. And then remember again, the non-profit organization definition of the FATF that doesn't include all organizations. So let's try to combine all of that and understand what the hell is happening here and how this process actually works. There are four essential steps uh, to comply with the FATF standard. Can I ask something really quickly? Yes, go. Um, so when Turkish MPs of uh, law origin were mentioning why this law was enacted in the first place, they always mentioned recommendation number seven, uh, meaning that Turkey was asked to comply with number seven and number 12. But I understand that number seven and eight are among the same group under C, like section, the terrorist financing and proliferation of these mass, yes. uh, mass yes. weapons. But then, like, how how is it possible that Turkey was specifically asked to comply with number seven? Not and like, is this is this an oversight or? Um, now that we're reading eight, I realize that it's about specifically about N NGOs, but how, how are they related, these recommendations? And also I have another question, but maybe it's irrelevant at this point, but 12 is even more important for the Turkish context, it seems like uh, the transparency for the net worth of politically exposed uh, important exposed persons, exactly. And they did nothing, for example, to comply with this recommendation. So how will the evalu evaluation process or uh, punishment process to simplify it uh, work for Turkey in this 
in this context? Thanks for the question. Let me just finish these steps and then you'll probably understand better why the Turkey uh, invoked other recommendations and not this one in a justification for the law. So for the non-profit sector, what the country must do is first, step one, actually conduct a risk assessment for the non-profit sector that identifies organizations that are vulnerable to terrorist abuse. Now, if you remember, there is an overarching requirement to conduct overall risk assessment for the whole country, right? So that's recommendation one. Recommendation eight actually asks that specifically also for the non-profit sector. So the country should actually do almost like two assessments of the uh, risk. One is the national risk assessment for the entire economy, all the sectors, the entire country. And then within that or separately, uh, they have to actually look closely in more detail about the risks for particularly non-profit sector. That should result in a very small uh, targeted subset of organizations that are at risk for being abused by terrorist financing. Yeah? So again, if you imagine the entire non-profit world in one country, only one part of it is actually fitting under non-profit organization definition for the FETF purpose, but only even smaller part will be subject to the recommendation eight because once you do correctly the risk assessment and identify which organizations or which subset of the sector is actually at risk, you will come to a very smaller uh, to a smaller number of organizations, not the entire sector. And that's risk-based approach. So that's step number one. Step number two for every country should be review the existing regulatory and any other framework or measures to see if they address the identified risks. So in step one, you identified the risks, you identified the subset of the organizations that fall under that risk. In step two, you need to look back at your legal system, at the sector's self-regulatory measures. Anything can fall under that. It's not just laws and regulations. So codes of conduct, uh, internal uh, requirements for, for, so for example, big organizations working in, in a country already have their internal mechanisms for protecting themselves from you know, abuse of funds and so on. So every of any of these measures can be assessed and reviewed to see whether we have enough, can we address the risks that we identified, or there are gaps. After that, you come to the step three. When you find the gaps in your own system of measures, existing ones, then you develop new measures. New measures, according to the FATF, any measures can be laws, regulation, can be self-regulatory mechanisms, educational activities, awareness raising, campaigns, dialogue with the sector. So any kind of soft measures play a huge role in mitigating the risks. So maybe the country, to give you an example, the country may say we have enough legislation and rules to actually oversee and monitor uh, the, those that are at risk for terrorism financing. But we, uh, we identified that actually none of our uh, sector, uh, none of our organizations understand the risk well. Um, they, they don't really know that they are at risk. So maybe the educational activities or you know, guidance or uh, some campaign or, or a dialogue and outreach would be helpful to mitigate some of these measures. And that works in some countries they have adopted these types of measures and got a positive mark, a uh, positive score from the FATF without actually going into the huge you know, regulatory changes. Step four, I mentioned the interpretative note of the recommendation eight. The language in the interpretative note of the recommendation eight explicitly requires the countries to create measures and develop measures that are consistent with obligations under international human rights law and humanitarian law. So any new regulation, any new law 
that the country adopts in the name of recommendation eight implementation and the FATF standards implementation must be compliant and proportionate with obligations from the human rights and humanitarian law. Through all these steps, the countries are required to conduct outreach towards the nonprofit sector. Now, the FATF will come to the uh, unpacking of how they understand outreach. They have moved from understanding outreach as I am giving you information into outreach as more of an engagement. We are having a dialogue on this topic. Yeah? So they, we are kind of pushing in that dialogue direction and engagement direction more and more, and they are understanding uh, this more and more. And now even the FATF in the last couple of years is using the term engagement and effective engagement and engagement with the nonprofit sector and so on. So throughout all this process, there must be outreach and engagement, which is going to be scored and evaluated by the FATF for the country. And to come back to your question, why Turkey is using other recommendations to slip uh, through the legislation that is effectively coming under recommendation eight? Because they are avoiding this whole four step process. OK, so if they are if countries regulating anything regarding nonprofit sector, they need to do it with these steps. One, two, three, four, plus outreach throughout all because it falls under recommendation eight. Now, the country can write whatever they want in the preamble of their law, but the FATF will look at the content and they will look at the impact and they will look at the effectiveness and they will look for the risk-based approach. And this is why we read it, Turkey basically to the FATF and said they didn't do it. We'll come back to the strategies and advocacy and avenues how we can push back on this. So effectively, in Turkey, we have a case to claim the country never did one, two, three, four steps. It's not consistent with the standard. It's not implementing correctly the standard and the requirements of the recommendation eight. It's not even implementing the recommendation one, which is the overarching standard. It's a gold you know, standard for every recommendation. They're not doing it. It's not a risk-based approach. So there is uh, arguments to push back. Yeah. The main thing is to understand it and to unpack it. What should actually risk-based approach look like and engagement? What should it look like? It means that it has to have evidence-based measures. So measures the government introduce that are based on something existing, which is identified as risk. As I mentioned, it has to have a sustained outreach to civil society and ongoing engagement. The measures must be proportionate to the risk. So there must be a balancing between the risks and the law that is being adopted. Plus, it must have, uh, uh, it must respect the obligations of human rights law, humanitarian law. And of course, it should be developed with the engagement of the sector. Now, let's see some of the main features of these couple of elements, just to understand it further. And then we can discuss more. <clears throat> on examples of, of some of these uh, 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 situations. So the countries, for the risk-based approach, the countries must understand the risk for every particular sector in their country, specifically for the non-profit sector. So the country must be able to say and to demonstrate to evaluators, these are the risks for non-profit organizations. These are the non-profit organizations that are at risk, and these are the particular measures that we have identified that we already have in our country addressing the risks. Uh, so the countries must apply risk-based approach. That means any measure they introduce should be proportionate or con commensurate with the risk that is identified. And every measure should include a specific allocation of resources in order to be efficient. Now, in practice, that means if you as a country identify a higher risk in a particular segment or particular area, of course, you will introduce more stricter measure, right? If you identify a lower or even no risk in a particular area or for a particular group of uh, stakeholders or a sector, you will have very simple or soft uh, 
measures introduced. So that's the basics of the risk-based approach. How that looks in practice? Uh, if you look at this photo, if this uh, diagram of the non-profit sector, as I mentioned, the blue and orange combined is the entire non-profit world in one country. The blue part is the non-profits that don't fit the FATF definition of non-profit organizations. The orange part is non-profits that are fitting the definition of the non-profit sector. And when the country does its risk assessment, they look at the entire orange part. Now, the end result of the risk assessment is the dark orange part. Only the subset of the sector, which can be smaller, bigger, orange part, depending on the country, will be those organizations that the measures should apply to. If we translate that into a law, that means when the country designs and develops a new law or, or a new regulation to address uh, terrorist financing risk, they should not design the law to apply to all the orange and blue organizations, not even for the all orange organizations. No, the regulation, the measure should apply to dark orange organizations only. And that's risk-based approach. And that's considered FATF proportionate standard. Can I quickly ask a question? Yes. Um, the outreach and engagement with NPOs throughout the whole um, process <coughs> one to four, is that with all NPOs or just the ones that are defined as NPOs by um, FATF? Good question. So ideally, uh, at the beginning of the step one, which is the identification of the risk, if you consider the situation where the country is starting as a clean slate, so let's say they never did the risk assessment before for the nonprofit sector, which is still many countries in the world, they look at their entire blue plus orange sector, and they need to first sit down and identify which organizations actually fall under the definition of the FATF. Once they do that, they should start engagement with the orange part of the sector, right? All of them. Usually that's done in, 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 in the good practice examples, few of them that we witness and know of, it's done with umbrella groups or some kind of coalition groups or some kind of, you know, overarching uh, leading groups in the country that have a capacity to actually talk to the government uh, about this issue. Uh, it is recommended to in include different representatives of different subgroups in the sector. So, for example, the humanitarian organizations, donor organizations, foundations, religious organizations, if they fall under the definition, usually they should, um, different, you know, uh, uh, associations. The FATF considers that expressive and advocacy groups are not actually falling under this risk that much because they are not usually the ones that disperse huge amounts of funds, right? So it's more of the humanitarian organizations working in the proximity of the terrorist threat or large organizations distributing large amounts of funding uh, or donor organizations that might have, you know, some internal uh, or weak internal mechanism that could be abused and so on. So uh, uh, an amount of funds plays a role. Um, the, the proximity to the terrorist threat, whether it's physical in, in terms of geography or whether it's organizations working overseas, maybe with you know, countries or territories where there is a terrorist threat or, or a terrorist situation, that plays a role as well. So the, 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 the good intended country would aim to capture in their dialogue and engagement each of these subgroups of the sector because they want to involve them in the risk assessment in order to be able to get help from the sector identifying where the risks are, right? So the, the, the role of the sector here is not only to be engaged per se, it's actually to help identify some of the risks and actually help offer some mitigating measures because we in the nonprofit sector actually do a lot 
to, 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 to mitigate our own risks for our own purposes, not for the terrorist financing agenda, but for our own you know, uh, transparency and accountability purposes. All of these can actually help fit into the measures that are being uh, uh, used to uh, mitigate the risks. I've listed some good practices here. One of the good practices that we promote, and we work in countries to do that, in the phase of the risk assessment is to actually set up a joint collaborative risk assessment methodology, which is what we piloted in a couple of countries, Tunisia, Kyrgyzstan, North Macedonia, Kosovo. The World Bank has now adopted that methodology as well, and they're doing it and piloting it in a Caribbean. So essentially that means that there is a collaboration, a co-creation of the risk assessment identification between non-profit sector and the government in the form of the joint working group with non-profit representatives uh, from various these subgroups and subsectors uh, to represent you know, as many variety of, of non-profit world uh, that fit the FATF standard. And then there is a particular methodology for a risk assessment that is adapted for the non-profit sector. It includes surveys <laughs> within the sector. It includes giving feedback on what the sector actually already does, and it does a lot, in order to mitigate their own accountability and transparency risks. And then all that data kind of field, feeds into, together with the government review of the legal framework. And then in the end, there's a very complex metrics uh, that uh, identifies the levels of risks for particular groups and subsets of nonprofit organizations. And then the government and uh, nonprofit uh, sector jointly uh, design, ideally after the risk assessment is done, jointly design the new or additional needed measures. Uh, my colleague will talk more about this process uh, and an example of this process in Kosovo. Let me just go quickly through the what does it mean to have adequate measures for non-profit sector, because that's also a really important part of the scoring. Uh, adequacy of measures is scored as measures that are risk-based, so they need to be based on some kind of risk identified beforehand, in a step before. No one-size-fits-all approach. No, that's a no. That's a non-compliance score. No. Measures need to actually be effective, so if they're not effective but they're nicely designed, no, no score. Measures should uh, follow the do no harm principle, meaning they should not uh, restrict legitimate MPO activities. This is the exact language that the, uh, the standard requires. They should respect fundamental freedoms and rights, including humanitarian law. They should be devised through outreach and consultation, and any measure should have resources included which ties into their effectiveness. So if, the, if there is a nice measure of, you know, an oversight that the government will do uh, once in six months for a certain subset of uh, NPOs that are at high risk, great. But if there is no money uh, for that oversight, then it's not considered effective. Also, I mentioned NPO sector has a lot of good measures already uh, that can count as mitigating measures. Just some of the examples include some basic good governance that organizations, especially the bigger organizations that move a lot of funding or do a lot of big humanitarian work already have in their robust internal governance practices. So any kind of organizational integrity, already existing rules uh, within the organizations for partner relationships and you know, sub-grantee relationships, any financial transparency and accountability rules within the organization, any rules on how the programs are planned and monitored internally, all these are mitigating measures. So it doesn't have to be laws, right? So all of this falls according to the FETF standards and best practice papers and recommendations, all that falls under good practice mitigating measures. Now, how they consider engagement, what the FETF says about engagement. I mentioned they moved from Outreach to engagement yeah, in the last couple of years. So they say, and you can always quote these recommendations and standards, they say that authorities must consult with all stakeholders when undertaking a risk assessment. So that's, if you remember, step number one. So they should consult nonprofits when doing a risk assessment. Then the methodology asks countries to work with nonprofit organizations 
to develop and refine best practices to address financing risks, right? Then it also requires a participatory approach to risk assessment in its own guidance. So there's a lot of uh, 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 information from the FATF itself in the last couple of years, how they require countries to actually collaborate with nonprofit sector. So they are really looking, and we have seen that in their evaluation reports. So they comment in the evaluation reports about the lack of sustained outreach. So the outreach must be continuous. Uh, they have uh, known to comment in the evaluation reports if the government does a one-off event before the evaluation and then nothing else. They say it's not enough. It's not a continuous outreach. They look whether the outreach has been meaningful, uh, meaning like actual conversation and dialogue. So they are really getting a little bit better step by step in evaluating how this outreach is actually conducted so that it's not just a tick box exercise. And there are numerous quotes you can also use from there, you know, uh, different uh, conclusions from different plenary and private sector consultative meetings, how the, uh, how the countries should, you know, uh, conduct consultation and inclusiveness because it enriches all assessments, evaluations and so on. So what are the actual entry points in that cycle of the whole evaluation process when the civil society can get engaged, really? Uh, in three, roughly in three stages, before the actual evaluation visit, during the actual evaluation visit, and afterwards as a follow-up. So before the actual evaluation visit, the country usually does the national or specifically non-profit risk assessment. This should include and involve non-profit organizations. Then the country should do the targeted measure development for addressing the risks. This should be discussed with non-profits. Then any concerns from the non-profit sector about their own risks. So, you know, maybe in some countries there is open enough dialogue where Organizations can actually come and say, we are concerned about these particular risks. This should be taken on board. During the meeting with the evaluators, so if the nonprofit sector actually meets with the evaluators, the evaluators will ask the nonprofit sector about their own perception of the risk. So what is your view, how you feel that you are uh, exposed to the terrorist financing risk? Are you even aware of any of the risks? And they take that into account. And they take it into account in a way as a failure from the government if the organizations lack any awareness of the risk. So in a country where there is no or little risk identified in a good risk assessment, okay, it might be, it might be considered uh, normal that organizations are not really aware of the terrorist financing risk because there's actually none, right? Or very low risk. But in the countries where the risk by the government is identified as higher or medium high level. It's a problem if the organizations show actual lack of awareness about the risk, right? It's a problem for the government. Effectiveness, they are, the evaluators are asking about the effectiveness of the measures. So are, does this law actually do, does it do the work it's supposed to do in terms of providing monitoring information or oversight information, or is it simply burdensome for the sake of being burdensome, right? So that, that's the distinction they are looking for. And here, the organizations can really point that out as a concern, the over-regulation part. And then in the follow-up, of course, when the governments need to follow up the uh, requirements and the recommendations from the report, they need to include non-profit sectors. So there's uh, there is a, 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 a role for nonprofits in the follow-up stages as well. Now, in practice, <clears throat> challenges include numerous things. Some of them are on the FATF side. So the challenges on the FATF side usually are that evaluation teams in general don't include anyone who knows anything about NPO sector. Even worse, in the trainings and education that the evaluators receive, in the last years, they started doing more and more um, material on recommendation eight implementation and how it should be implemented effectively, but still it's not enough. We are currently working through our global coalition with the FATF, 
to produce. So we will produce additional training material like compendiums and short briefs for the evaluators on international human rights standards, humanitarian law and negative consequences of the FATF standards on non-profit sector because the evaluators simply don't know. Uh, and those who are training them also don't know. There's mostly, in most cases, lack of any kind of outreach to the sector from the government. So the sector has to fish for information about all of these processes in various ways, from the FATF websites, from the governmental websites of ministries of finance, if they manage to find something. They have to you know, dig through the, the, the complex web of uh, financial intelligence units, maybe find somebody who can give them information. Usually all of this process is highly non-transparent on all levels, national and international. So there's a lot of like research, but uh, kind of detective work research uh, required. And there is, on top of all this, <laughs> There is also conflation with the anti-money laundering standards. So the FATF recommendation 8 or any other recommendation doesn't require uh, any kind of anti-money laundering action for the non-profit sector specifically. The FATF does have recommendations on anti-money laundering and beneficial ownership and ho the whole transparency and disclosure part on uh, combating money laundering. However, the FATF does not target specifically non-profit sector with this set of recommendations and standards. But on the national level side, we do see very, very often in many countries and in many problematic country countries the conflation of the two standards. To give you an example, the government will usually adopt a law that is both anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing, uh, packs both of the things in one regulation, under one framework. And there, because of the recommendation eight requirement, they will include something about civil society or non-profits at large. But, they will also include it under the IML part as well, whereas they're not required. So we see a lot of gold plating uh, on the IML uh, standards and requirements, meaning the governments themselves are introducing higher standards and obligations on anti-money laundering uh, uh, requirements for non-profit organizations going overboard of what the FATF actually required. FATF doesn't require them to do anything on money laundering part for the non-profit sector. They're still doing it, okay? In some countries, they're doing it on purpose. In many countries, they're not doing it on purpose to restrict organizations. They're doing it because they think they need to do it because it's kind of conflated with this whole framework that they are doing. And they, they get, then they get surprised when the FATF tells them you don't need to do it. Yeah? The problem is that our sector, of course, is under obligations for money laundering requirements, reporting, or some restrictions in some countries because the governments keep thinking or claiming they need to do it under international standards. No, they don't. There's a whole other issue with the EU member states. We don't have time to go into that because the EU has a stricter anti-money laundering standards for everybody, uh, stricter than the FATF standards, but this is a whole nother story. Uh, here we have a set of problems with EU member countries that also go overboard on anti-money laundering standards. I'm just flagging the IML for you because in many cases the anti-money laundering is used for uh, cracking down on civil society or freezing their funds uh, or accounts, or even you know uh, the Uganda example, if you were following uh, one of the activists, prominent ones there, was charged for anti-money laundering uh, embezzlement and put in, in, in detention and is now awaiting trial, uh, uh, particularly on AI, IML standards, right? Again, the FATF does not require these standards for non-profit organizations, countries often conflate it. Now, coming to, pot to potential strategies for civil society, in all of these 
engagement, pushback, uh, kind of different variety of options. We usually identify four uh, potential strategies for civil society. One, in a country where that is manageable and doable, to become a strategic partner and actually work with the governmental institutions on this topic in order to preserve and safeguard that the government doesn't do harm to the sector. We have seen that succeed in countries that are unlikely uh, uh, successful on this, like Tunisia. We have seen uh, organizations that are not uh, usually cooperating with the government on other policies in Tunisia, managing to work together with the financial intelligence unit of the government on this particular topic. Why? Because it was in mutual interest. It was in the interest of the government to score well. It was in the interest of the sector to actually protect themselves from not going into, not, you know, skipping into over-regulation. And there we had this mutual work a group between the government and non-profit sector strategically working on the risk assessment. They succeeded, they did a good risk assessment, they got a compliance score, and now Tunisia is, you know, overly proud of themselves how they did the good practice example, and they're exporting that all over. Fine. The second uh, strategy is constructive criticism, where that is possible to work. Uh, we've seen that in Germany. I'll give you an example later in Germany. The third strategy is campaign and resistance, pushback. Uh, we try to help in many countries uh, this tactic, but there you need to have a group of organizations really well trained in these standards uh, and really understanding the arguments so that they can push back in, in a variety of ways. We've also seen the strategy of tactical silence, uh, where organizations understand the process, they understand the standard, we train them, they monitor the process, they see the government doing it, they, they are not involved. Uh, the government doesn't involve them, they ignore them, but the organizations tactically decide not to make a fuss because they think it's better uh, not to make a fuss because they think making a fuss might end up in getting a worse score and then having more crackdown or over-regulation on them or any combination of the, of the above. In the engagement part options, if this is an option, We've seen and we have helped organizations engage on the risk assessment. We have helped organizations form coalitions uh, on country level, get uh, particularly umbrella organizations involved uh, and different types of organizations involved to adopt the issue and, and work together and advocate. We have helped them engage with particular institutions they've never talked to before, specifically the financial institutions or financial intelligence unit people. Uh, and we try to open a dialogue, to help them open the dialogue with these institutions about some concerns. Uh, also open a dialogue with other relevant bodies, with the FATF or the regional bodies uh, concerned. Uh, maybe Esther, my colleague, can give you a short example how that worked in Kosovo for their risk assessment. Yeah, thank you. Uh, happy to do that. Um, basically, it was a combination of various engagement options, what Vanya mentioned. So um, in Kosovo, because of the special status, it was an EU project which was uh, conducting the risk assessment. And uh, we had a chance uh, to, to engage from the very beginning and build up a good cooperation with them together with local organizations, like a network, an umbrella organization called Civicus. And I just want to give you four examples, like what happened throughout the process. The first one is that right from the start, we co-organized uh, a meeting. Uh, together with this uh, EU funded project to explain the anti-money laundering and counterterrorism uh, financing standards and how any, uh, NGOs can get engaged in this process. So that was really important to also discuss like the scope of NPOs. The second one, what we did, we already, um, the government set up a government NGO joint uh, working group, um, which included for a free NGO representatives, so it was really important that they were uh, uh, engaged in the discussions. And uh, this working group was overseeing uh, the, the sectoral risk assessment process. So we kind of try to make sure that NGOs are involved in uh, the discussions and we co-organize the first working group meetings together with them. Uh, 
And the third one is, is training and the data collection procedure. So it was actually quite participatory in a way that uh, uh, a local NGO was assigned to conduct interviews with 150 or organizations and they were trained to do these interviews uh, the right way. And uh, the fourth is that um, we had a chance to participate at the working group meetings uh, together with the, the local NGO. So we, we discussed the strategy, uh, discussed the draft uh, 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 sectoral risk assessment, uh, and uh, they had a say basically in the, in, uh, in the document itself. Um, so that's about the risk assessment, but uh, as Wanya said, it's also like various procedures. So we were also involved together with NGOs uh, in the mutual evaluation uh, uh, report to prepare uh, local organizations to, to get engaged when the, the evaluators are reaching out to them and later on to discuss the, the measures to make sure that uh, no measures are introduced, which are actually restricting their, 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 their space. So. This is just very shortly, and I'm happy to discuss it in the, the group discussion. Thanks, Esther. Uh, one uh, additional example uh, I promised to explain is uh, from Germany. <clears throat> the German nonprofit network, network Venro uh, actually did a kind of a shadow risk assessment for nonprofit sector, for, the, for their own sector. So they actually uh, conducted a survey uh, among themselves, among the sector, to find out how they perceive and how they assess the risk of terrorist financing and what measures the sector itself already does or has in terms of soft uh, measures, so non-regulatory measures that already address or minimize the risk. Now, they were doing this, yes, the government knew that they were doing it. The government kind of wasn't particularly keen on involving the uh, organizations uh, fully in their own risk assessment, but they said, okay, you can do your own thing, you can do your own kind of survey, we'll see what you come up with. They came up with a really good report, and you can find it, uh, again, we'll share the link, uh, the report is in English already, uh, and within there, so the, the whole aim of the exercise was to show to the government, we already do a lot, don't put additional regulation on us. We already have it. We have everything to mitigate the risk in our sector already. They analyze also the legal framework uh, in Germany. They analyze their own internal codes of conduct, self-regulatory documents, internal procedures in different organizations and so on. They gave a, a whole section on recommendations. What else is needed in terms of soft measures? Education, awareness, guidance, and so on. They offered that they will do some of these uh, uh, also in collaboration with government if needed. They sent the report to the government. And two weeks ago, a colleague from Germany uh, wrote us an email. The government adopted ahead of the evaluation because they are being evaluated in a couple of months. The government adopted their own national risk assessment. There is a specific section for nonprofits. The government adopted a lot of their things from the report, a lot of their recommendations. They quoted. Uh, data and information and 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 uh, findings from their report, so they actually included their uh, shadow risk assessment in their official document, and they will probably try to pass it on as a outreach and engagement uh, when the evaluators come. Right, so that was one uh, example of the engagement option. Pushback options, uh, of course, uh, pushback on restrictions, specifically when they are not risk-based, when they are not targeted, when they are not proportionate. We try to help organizations uh, uh, make the case for uh, arguments against existing or draft legislation, which are not in line with all of these standards and all the steps one to four that we enumerated. So basically the organizations and the, and the sector needs to kind of monitor and keep tab and follow what the government is doing all the time if they're introducing any new measures or regulation in order to comply with the FATF standards and recommendations. Pushback options are on national level, but on international level, of course, they can be, uh, they can include raising these issues with the FATF itself, with other regional bodies, with the UN bodies, and so on. 
uh, we'll talk about these strategies more particularly for Turkey uh, in, in our groups, but maybe Luben, my colleague, can give an example uh, of Bulgaria pushback advocacy campaign. Yes, thank you, Vanya. In, in Bulgaria, we had the case where the anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing obligations were mixed or are mixed. And uh, when the government developed a new anti-money laundering law, it put CSOs as obliged entities. They had to comply with the same requirements and undertake the same steps as banks, for example. Uh, which, of course, was a big surprise. Uh, moreover, CSOs had no idea that such a draft law was de was being developed. However, we, we found out that there was a process of uh, consultation that started, and, and that's how we found out about this. So uh, the, what, the, what the local organization did wa was first identify a core group of CSOs, which uh, should be informed about this negative development, should uh, understand how this will affect negatively their operation, and would be willing to support future advocacy efforts. Uh, the next thing, uh, or simultaneously with this, uh, the organization uh, had to develop uh, arguments against this, and uh, ACNL helped a lot in drafting and framing the arguments. Uh, and then the next step was, uh, uh, however, to engage with these institutions uh, because, for example, the, uh, the leading institution was the National Security Agency. I mean, CSOs avoid having anything in common with the national security agencies usually, so uh, they didn't know anyone there. They're, they managed to find some contacts through uh, politicians that had access to the agency. Uh, and uh, actually, CSOs offered help to the National Security Agency in designing the measures for CSO specifically. Uh, and then from the first initial contact, the main thing was building credibility and, uh, you know, helping uh, explain how the measures would affect CSOs initially, then monitoring how the measures were implemented in practice and what their impact on CSOs was uh, and providing feedback to the National Security Agency and engaging with them in developing a risk assessment methodology. So, so these are just examples, but very importantly now, uh, there is a cooperation between CSOs and the National Security Agency and specifically our partner the Bulgarian Center for Not-for-Profit Law, who are seen as experts uh, that can support the agency rather than as critics that just try to bother the agency. Maybe just to mention that the law actually then didn't include all the restrictive requirements. You managed to actually strip it down to be more manageable, right? Yes, yes, yes. That's very important. Of course, it was a, a good result in the end. Not the best possible, though, because CSO still has certain obligations, but it's much, much better. Thank you, Luben. And finally, just want to uh, uh, say, I know we are nearing the break, uh, so I'll have just a few more minutes. Uh, just a couple of entry points uh, uh, that the FATF is now offering as well. Uh, so the FATF has opened up on their website a possibility for uh, any organization to provide concerns input for the upcoming assessments, uh, for the upcoming evaluation to a particular email contact. Uh, this should probably concern mostly those countries that are up for the evaluation, but since we mentioned the evaluation is an ongoing sunk cycle, we kind of decided to read it uh, in, a, in a more broader sense, and we are uh, offering this interpretation uh, that these concerns can be uh, asserted to the FATF at any point of the uh, evaluation, because anyhow, countries are going through the you know, constant follow-up, constant assessments, and so on. So they are offering at least a possibility to raise concerns about all of these elements if they are applied correctly in the particular country for the nonprofit sector. If they are not applied correctly or if there are some issues, concerns for overregulation or non-risk based approach or measures are not proportionate and so on. So if they don't follow the standards, 
non-profit organizations can now send concerns, right? This is what we did for Turkey already. Uh, and we'll talk about it more, how we can uh, make use of that uh, further on. Another resource is, as I mentioned, our global NPO coalition on the FATF. We work directly with the FATF in advocacy and now monitoring the implementation of this recommendation eight and always try to push them to do more to, first of all, recognize that there are still uh, over restrictions and to do something about it. Uh, and then to train the evaluators finally so that they can, you know, apply the standards uh, consistently throughout the world. We also have an expert hub, so-called expert hub. Uh, this is basically our own uh, small community of, uh, well, not so small anymore, uh, a community of organizations that we have trained throughout the years in various continents, in various regions on this topic. So they kind of exchange uh, practices, they exchange knowledge, lessons learned. Uh, we invite them often to speak at the UN level or, or the FATF level or the regional level where they can contribute to policy development and, and contribute to the voices, uh, being voices from the ground actually to explain how uh, these uh, standards impact them on the ground. Question time. And, and thank you for your patience once again. <laughs>